I'll do my very best to get this job that I so crave. Hey, welcome back to Multiplex Fan Zone Debate. We are here uh, for a uh, another debut match uh, post Mayhem at the Multiplex Five. We are doing all these uh, singles debut matches in uh, Fan Zone Debate, and I'm very much looking forward to it uh, because. We're going to get some fresh blood uh, and some new people on the roster in the matches uh, that have been just absolutely annoying the shit out of me. They've been knocking on my door like, Tim, when am I going to get to play? Tim, they're just saying it over and over. I'm just kidding. They signed up on a post. Uh, I'm very excited, though, because like I said, new people, always good. Interesting to see what they can do if they've got what it takes. Uh, so we got Will Cohen. We got Brandon Cohen. Yes. I made them play because they have the same last name. That's the only reason. There was literally no other reason. That was why. Uh, Kirk, you're here to judge this one with us. How you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. Uh, I'm excited for this one. Like you said, it's great to see so many you know new people interested in the game. Um, you know, I know Will a little bit more be uh, better than Brandon. But I haven't seen either of them in this kind of setting, uh, and you know, just new personalities new strategies new takes on the game are always fun to see so uh, i'm really looking forward to this match and brian you are here uh how are you feeling yeah i've, I've seen both these guys around I, i've been i think involved in a couple of like just for fun things with them but obviously not in debate i have not seen either the debate in any league or anything i don't know if they have or not but so it, uh yeah it'll be nice to see something new we don't know what to expect we haven't heard him so see what happens yeah all right, well, let's bring him in. We'll start with uh, Brandon of the Cohen Variety. Uh, Brandon, welcome to the show. I don't think you and I have ever met, but uh, I'm looking forward to yeah. having you. Yeah, how are you doing, sir? Are you excited? Uh, have you debated before in other leagues? How do you feel about Will? I, let's do it all. Oh, I, I mean, I don't want to get in both feel about Will because that would taint the rest of the show. But um, I'm excited. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, you say we signed up on a post and I'm learning now that I need to read the posts. Cause when you messaged me, I was like, what am I doing? I don't remember signing up for this. So I'm excited. I got some notes. I'm ready to uh, argue my shit and uh, we'll see how I do. Sounds good to me. That's all I got. Uh, Will will bring in will will welcome. Uh, do you remember signing up on the post? I do remember signing up on the post. Uh, before before the green room was set up, I just didn't realize that you remembered that I you know that I I, I went back that. I went I went back and looked. That's that's fair. <laughs> um, but after uh, uh, I have been doing a uh, movie battlegrounds a little bit as well, and so I'm eager to see how I do in this format. The format's a little bit different. Uh, I'm still very new to debate this is my first year doing any kind of debate settings as well as trivia so we'll see what happens yeah yeah people keep saying the format is different i wouldn't know but here's how this show works uh there were four questions given to the players based off of uh, four categories that they drafted um so they are going to debate those questions tonight before our very souls uh and at the end of each question brian kirk and i are going to write on our handy dandy boards who we think won that question and the uh best two out of three votes wins the point and the first person to three points wins the match you each get a one minute opening and a one minute closing uh and in between that is your five minute free form so uh gentlemen do you have any questions about how this is going to work no not really just want to point out also on july 15th from will i completely forgot i signed up for the debate league so it caught him in a lie already Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I don't remember sending that post, but, but he doesn't remember sending the post. Either. Lies, lies, <laughs> caught in the act, gentlemen. I got receipts. Let's do this. Don't worry, I'll do my. That's the wrong video. Let's do this. We're off to a great start. Uh, so, uh, guys. Am I better than that, or am I Mark Wahlberg in that? Uh, you and I were asking the same question, buddy. 
you can be whoever you want to be. Uh, so we're going to kick this off with the first question, uh, which is going to be from the category of DreamWorks. This was drafted by Will. And the question is, what DreamWorks film would be the worst to turn into a live action film? Uh, so, Will, you drafted this. That means you get to go first. You have one minute to open your argument when you start talking, and I will come in to give you a 10-second countdown when the time comes. So, for the worst DreamWorks film that would be uh, – that could possibly go live action, I had to go Kung Fu Panda for one simple reason. It would just be pointless. If if that remake of the lion king showed us anything it's that you can make things photorealistic but it's essentially going to be pointless when there's no people in itself to act off of and that's kung fu panda's problem is that there's no human character so really putting you know essentially a bunch of cgi characters in quote unquote a real setting just that's just that's still technically animation that's just absolute animation just in a different format now if there were you know if there was some you know if there was something to go off of there was some interesting angle they could do that'd be one thing but there really isn't and let's just face it that would be horrible time okay uh we'll move over to brandon brandon you now have one minute to open your argument when you start talking so I think Ants would be the worst DreamWorks animation to be made into a live action film because going off of photorealistic, when it comes to like The Lion King or The um, the Jungle Book, you can kind of see some emotion in the characters' faces. But having just tiny little ants running around, especially just voiced by Woody Allen being all hot and bothered, would not work at all. The movie's kind of about nothing. It's just ants talking. He kind of becomes a hero, but it's really just ants talking. So just having a zoomed out setting of just these ants running around, talk about pointless, that would be the most pointless thing ever because you couldn't be able to read anything off their faces. It's just little tiny ants walking around. Okay. Uh, ending about 20 seconds early. Ants! Versus Kung Fu Panda. Gentlemen, you have five minutes when one of you starts talking. Please don't talk over each other. Or I'll get very, very sad. So don't make me sad. So after rewatching Ants recently, I realized that what they did was very interesting. They actually made the ants more human. And so they had human faces. They stood upright. They had human interactions you know, versus ant interactions, really. And so it would actually be pretty easy to translate that into live action in fact you can actually make it with practical effects you can put them in you know costumes with puppet effects it could actually be kind of fun whereas with kung fu panda these are characters that the only way you can really do it without it looking really 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 horrible is by doing it cgi but if once you make all the characters cgi why are you making a live action film to begin with so my rebuttal for the uh, practical effects or humanizing you know, the ants' faces was we all saw, or actually probably didn't all see cats. So having these ant, these these life-size people with these fake ant faces would be absolutely horrifying. And we all saw how that worked out. I think on the other side with Kung Fu Panda is, yes, it's Kung Fu Panda, but you can have these animals, you can kind of take a different spin on it so they can have these animals fighting. It does. It can just be a panda who's fat and lazy and needs to prove himself and to these other animals. So you can have them fight. It doesn't have to actually have them standing up doing, you know, Kung Fu. It can be kind of more of a, um, who's throwing stuff at me. That's fun. Um, you, you can kind of be more of just like a coming of age tale or a guy who is fulfilling his destiny. It doesn't have to actually be like a CGI panda it can look like an actual panda, you know, do the photorealistic thing. So I just think, we've all seen how cats worked out. So I don't think that, I think they, if they did a CGI or a live action version of ants, I really think they wouldn't have these, these horrifying faces. Of, you know. Well, then you're misunderstanding what I'm saying then, because with my, you know, my proposal for a live action ants film, it wouldn't be like cats. Cats use a lot of CGI in that and delved into the uncanny Valley. This would, you know, this would be, 
them in costumes. It would look, you know, it would look quasi cheesy, but they could lean into that very easily. Whereas the the pitch that you just gave for a live action Kung Fu Panda movie, A, it sounded like you said that there wouldn't be any action or Kung Fu, which would absolutely take out the meaning Kung Fu Panda. No, there would be just and then, in, in, sorry. It's okay. So that you know, so that's what I that's what I got out of that argument, and therefore that seems pointless. Second of all, if they're not, you know, so if they're not fighting, if you know, if they just looks like a real panda, well, that's still animation. That's still proving my point that if you're going to be doing these things and make it look like a real panda doing all these things, then why are you making an, you know, why aren't you just making an animated film? Why are you just making Kung Fu Panda Four or just something else to that regard? Yeah. Well, the question is, what would be the worst movie? So the fact that it's pointless doesn't really make it bad. It makes you don't want to see it. So if it's the worst movie where, like you said, they could make these animals fight each other and necessarily it could be pointless, but not be bad. But having that you said it itself in costumes and makeup being cheesy and kind of just honestly doing nothing and just talking, that would be, in my opinion, pointless, but also just not entertaining and a bad movie. But you see, the thing the thing with that is that there's many, many different things that involve puppets and involve practical effects like that that have been done in the past. And it's actually been done very well. And so giving people, you know, giving people a template to do something that could actually have a lot of potential automatically in my mind doesn't make that the worst thing ever. Just because ants is considered a lower, you know, a lower tier DreamWorks film doesn't necessarily mean it's the worst to be ad ad adapted for a live action film. I've seen lots of bad animated things go to live action. And they've actually been pretty good. Taking a beloved property such as Kung Fu Panda and trying to make it live action for some reason when it's going to be, you know, it's going to be CGI. It doesn't matter if it's photorealistic or not. It's going to be point. It's going to be a pointless endeavor because it's going to be one animation style versus another animation style you're adapting something and essentially just making it animated again and that's pointless yeah well they could also take the other route of just instead of kung fu instead of anim or like re photorealistic animals they could just use real actors and have you know a fat guy so have actual jack black learn kung fu and actually instead of animals just kind of translate the story into so there's other ways to do it besides just photorealistic animals Time. Okay. Uh, Brandon, we are going to start with you. Uh, you have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. Okay. So I just think with Kung Fu Panda, there's a lot you can do with it. You can do, uh, you know, like we've said, you can do the photorealistic um, animals. You can have them fighting in their ways that they fight and maybe even learn how to fight in different ways. It doesn't, it may be pointless, but it doesn't necessarily be a bad movie. You can also make the argument that you can just take the story and translate it into live action with live action actors. For me, I just think with the ants having, you know, the two ways he said with like the cats route or you go with the um, the puppet route, that just seems terrifying to me to have these giant, especially with what's going on with Woody Allen, just would be terrifying seeing these guys just talking and doing kind of nothing because that movie is just super boring. So I just think cats... Or not cats. See, now nah, I have my head. Ants doesn't work for me. It'd be horrible. All right. Uh, we will move over to Will, who has one minute to close his argument when he starts talking. So all the options that my opponent gave, you know, to try and make this a live action film, all just kind of go back to what I'm saying. What is the point? The, you know, the question was, what is the worst one? Meaning why, you know, which is the worst option to even make? Pointless is a not, you know, is that a definitely factor in that because you have to get people to actually want to go see this movie and a live action Kung Fu Panda movie, no one wants to see that. Whether you do it like in the style of the Jungle Book, where you did it in any of the styles that he mentioned, and especially the costume angle, Doing all of those with Kung Fu just sounds horrible. And he's only just, all he's doing to me is just proving my point that that is absolutely the worst. And it was never meant to be a big action film. It was mostly supposed to be this cutesy little, uh, you know, this cutesy little 
interact, you know, movie interaction with uh, interacting people that could easily be done with puppets. Time. Okay. <laughs> uh, we are going to bring in the judges. At least we know we're getting the weird question out of the way. Yeah, I guess that's fair. That's <laughs> fair. How are we doing, judges? Do you hate me yet? Uh, so that was a weird question. That was some weird shit. <laughs> um, I've done questions like this before, and uh, like with Pixar and like Disney and like stuff like that, and people usually like pick stuff. With like humans, and I, I, I didn't think this one through. Uh, that being said, I went with Brandon. Uh, I thought that this was fucking weird, and that uh, both of them kind of canceled each other out a lot. But at the end of the day, Brandon convinced me that whether or not it was the meaning of the question or not, at the end of the day, that ant puppets would be fucking horrifying, uh, and the movie Ants is boring. And at least the movie Kung Fu Panda is interesting. And so no matter what way you do it, it's at least more interesting than Ants. And I was convinced of that. So, Kirk, where are you going? Uh, I'm going to go the opposite. Actually. I'm going to go with Will on this one. Okay. And uh, my reasoning is, uh, again, uh, you both painted a really nightmarish picture of what these movies would be. So thank you for that. Um, but I think the, the a couple of things uh, out of the two, I mean, the, the puppets would be disturbing, but like, I mean, at least that's a kind of an interesting take on it. Yeah. And al also, I think that a couple of things Will said was the first one was that, uh, you know, you know, despite the animation factor, um, Kung Fu Panda's a beloved movie. Why would you remake that where Ants is kind of forgotten and give that another try? And also, I like he came at the end where. Um, a good point. Ants has a lot less action to it. So however you decide to put it on screen, you're going to have a lot less challenge um, translating that because you don't have to have them doing flip kicks and stuff. So that's that's the way I went with that one. Okay. Uh, Brian, where are you going? Um, home, please. <laughs> no, um, I, no, the question definitely should have been what DreamWorks film involving humans because, yeah, both yeah. of them would be <laughs> awful, awful movies. Um, I think a lot of it got, got dragged down into the, the logistics of how you would create the movie as, as opposed to what movie you know deserves and what movie would make a good movie. Um, I did find it kind of amusing when, when Will says, you know, there's no good way to do mine, but we can do your ants with puppets. And I'm like, really? That would, that would not be good either. Um, but so it really came down to, you know, logistically, they both suck. Uh, but uh, <laughs> like, like you, I felt, I felt that Brandon did a better job explaining to me why, you know, his film would just be boring and yeah like kirk said i mean yeah you could you could change it up you can do anything with it but then it's not even a remake anymore you know all right fair enough so brandon wins the first point uh so it is one to zero as we get into the next question which was drafted by brandon uh this was in the category of sports the question what is the best character in a baseball sports film. So, Will, you, or, or sorry, Brandon, you get to kick this off. You have one minute when you start talking. So, best character in a baseball film, I am going with Roy Hobbs from The Natural. For those who don't know, played by Robert Redford. He's playing catch with his, with his dad in the beginning of the movie. A tree gets hit by lightning. He makes a bat out of that tree. That's Wonder Boy. He takes it through him his entire career. About to get drafted, gets shot. And then 16 years later, as an old man gets signed as a rookie and he has the bat of, you know, Wonder Bat, just cracks, gets home runs. He bombed the ninth inning. He's bleeding. He hits a home run, shatters the lights, streams, flames come down, makes out, bangs Glenn Close, has a kid, and he's just the embodiment of, it's just the American dream. He just, he... He had hardship. He overcomes that, and he overcomes and becomes one of the best baseball players of all time. It's just an amazing story and very interesting, and what he overcomes and what he goes through makes him a great character. 
I'm sorry. I've never seen the natural. So that made me laugh really hard. And I saw Kirk laugh backstage. I'm so sorry. All right, Will, you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. So when I think sports movies, I think about the underdog. <clears throat> and for me, there is no better underdog than Scotty Smalls from The Sandlot. He is a great narrator. He is a very reliable narrator. And we get to see his journey from this just absolute nerd, this absolute geek. And he gets to, you know, then he just slowly evolves into a very good baseball player. Not as good as some of the other people on the team, but that was never the journey he, you know, he was going to take. But he, you know, but he began to love this game that he had no clue what it was about. And that's very compelling at the end of the day. You know, from, you know, from the time that he gets, you know, from the time he gets to learn how to catch a baseball and throw it from the time that he gets to learn to hit from the time that he gets to learn the rules how he bonds over the sport with his you know, his stepfather and his mother and to the very end that's a very compelling story and a very compelling character time all right sandlot the natural gentlemen five minutes of free form when one of you starts talking all right so my problem with smalls is he's not even the most interesting or best character in that movie He's, first off, you said he was the underdog, but he doesn't – underdog, you have to kind of make it. He doesn't really make it. He gets one shot, and then he has – then everyone else has to kind of cover his ass, and he gets saved by a blind Darth Vader. So he doesn't really kind of overcome any obstacle besides becoming friends. But and in that movie alone, you got – Ham is a better character, more more entertaining. Benny the Jet, you know, the cool – everybody wanted – I wanted to take Benny the Jet, but I didn't want to take a character from that movie. Everyone wanted the PF Flyers as a kid. Everyone wanted to be Benny the Jet. He's the one that made it as a pro. Smalls just became the um, the commentator at the end of the movie. So Smalls is kind of annoying and just doesn't really, for me, there's way better choices from that movie. But here's where you're wrong. He is the lens for the entire movie. We see everything through his eyes. And so we get to see him grow as a person. We get to see him essentially take the hero's journey. We get to see him evolve we get to see him become their friends we get to see their you know we get to see his friends rely on him for things and it be, you know he becomes part of the group he becomes an integral part of the group when he was a complete outsider to begin with and that's why that's very interesting let's move over to roy though roy kind of embodies all the reasons why i don't like superman as a character he's too perfect he you know he's just wait you know he's outrageously moral he is perfect at every aspect of the game he's a good runner he's a good hitter he's a good you know pitcher he just you know he is just perfect and uncorruptible in every single you know in every single way and that is boring after a while it's just extremely boring to watch this perfection just keep being perfect because there's nowhere to go from there you don't approve you never get to see any kind of a evolution from him really well he gets shot in the beginning of the movie and then he you know, talk about the hero's journey he gets shot doesn't think he's ever going to make it and then he ha then he relies on his skills and, and able to overcome those obstacles and go up and become the natural the great and when you talk about you know I, like because in sports movies for me when it comes to characters you got to have these these characters have to have these iconic moments and in baseball movies in particular, there's a couple iconic moments, and a lot of them are from the Sandlot. But a lot of them, you killing me, Smalls, or they're not regard, they're, or or jumping over. None of those moments actually involve Smalls. When you're when you want these big characters, you want these characters. We want to be memorable. And and as a baseball fan, the most memorable sports movie moment for me is him smashing the lights. So that for me, you know, you don't have to for sports movies. You want the hero. You want the guy who's amazing. That's 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 what you're looking for. You want someone that can overcome, who has some odds to overcome, but he's able to actually overcome those and prove to prove to all the viewers that wow, this guy actually made it. 
yeah, great. You have you, you get to watch him overcome, but he's just perfect in every regard. And you said yourself, he got shot. So he has this bullet in him for 16 years and he's still doing all of these superhuman feats. He's still whacking the ball so hard that it's shattering lights and virtual, you know, virtually causing lightning storms. It's so far-fetched and ridiculous. And then on top of it all, you know, he's just embroiled in this gambling scheme always like oh well i'm too good for that so i'm you know i'm not going to throw the game it's just he's just uncorruptible it's just boring and when he is not being mr perfect he is not a good team player he's yelling at you know he's yelling at his coach he's yelling at the owner of the team but with smalls on the other hand he is a team player he wants to be part of there and instead of giving you know instead of allowing himself to give up, he continues and becomes a good baseball player. And that's the reason why he is the you know one of the best characters in that, if not the best character from The Sandlot, because he's the only one who's honest. He's the only one who get you know, he's the only one who gives us really the good accounts of everything. And at the end when he gets to see, you know, when he gets the ball back from, as you put it, blind Darth Vader, that's such a very touching moment. That doesn't happen to anyone. That's an iconic moment right there. That's a moment that's relatable and iconic. And not only that, the great moment where he catches the ball for the first time, that, like watching his face just light up going, oh my God, I caught it. That's iconic and relatable. That's why Scotty Smalls is better than Roy because not only is he great, but he's relatable. Okay. Okay. Uh, Will, we are going to start with you. You have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. The great thing about The Sandlot in general is that it kind of redefines what a baseball movie is, where it can actually be about camaraderie as well as the sport. And that's why Scotty Smalls is such an integral part of that, because he's really the, you know, he turns out to be the glue that holds the entire group together. And so when we get to see him, you know, as the commentator, we get to see his life, you know, his lifelong friend hit that home run in that, you know, in the major leagues, that's such an iconic moment as well. Roy is essentially Superman without Superman powers, but he, you know, he's, he has that Wonder Boy bat. Oh, I made it by hand. Oh, uh, could he be cheating? No, he's not cheating. Oh, he's great at hitting. He's great at pitching. He's great at everything. Oh, I'm not going. I'm not going to sleep with random women. I'm going to do all of these great things. Okay, eventually that's just kind of boring, but we get to see Scotty Smalls actually evolve, and that's why he's better. Time. All right, we're going to move over to Brandon. One minute when you start talking. For me as a sports fan, you want these stars. You want someone that is larger than life, someone that little kids can look up to and say, I want to be that guy. I want to smash those lights. And for me, Smalls just isn't that guy. Like I said before, he's not even the best part of that movie. He's fourth, fifth best. The twins probably below him. He's probably like fifth best in that movie himself. There's iconic moments in the movie. None of them really you know, go around him. It's all everyone else trying to save him. Yeah, Roy's perfect, but that's what you want in a sports star. You want these guys that you can look up to that you're say like, I want to be that guy. You know, knocking a guy because he's good at baseball, that's what makes a good baseball player, right? He had the overcome. He overcome getting shot, right? He had the bullet in him, but he still made it. He was a pitcher before, you know, then he became a batter. He can do it all. And that, that's what sports movies are all about. Yeah, these cheesy moments, but for sports movies, you need those big set pieces. And that's why Roy Hobbs is the best baseball character. Time. All right. We will bring in the judges. Man, I have so much I want to say. I would, This is the one time I think I wish I would go first. I really do. Uh, but I can't because Brian's going first. Kirk, are you ready? You're muted, so I don't know. But it I, looks I like... am not. I am not ready. I'm ready to name down now. Okay, uh, Brian, kick us off. So, uh, uh, well, for starters, I think that Will made some really good points about how his character is, is more relatable. Because yes, when somebody is you know the perfect person, it can be it, it can be boring. Um, but I actually did end up going with Brandon again. Um, for me, I think that Will unintentionally kind of helped support. Brandon's argument because like uh you know Brandon talked about how 
uh, Smalls isn't even the best character in this movie. And then Will goes and says, well, you know, this is why Smalls is one of the best characters, if not the best character. So he kind of backed up what he said there. And then, um, well, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, then Brandon talks about how the iconic moments take place, you know, they, they don't involve Smalls. They take place around Smalls. And then Will said in his in his closing argument how, you know, there are, are iconic moments. Like when you watch his lifelong friend hit this home run in the major leagues, that's an iconic moment. Well, he's watching his friend do an iconic moment. So I just kind of think he shot himself in the foot a little bit there. I, I get what Will was trying to do. Of, of I thought the, co- the comparison to Superman was actually really interesting. I agree. Um, be, uh, of saying like if you, if you're too perfect, you're not a relatable, interesting character. So I liked that aspect, but I did find it funny that he the way he said it uh, beyond just the compare the immediate comparison of he's like Superman is God. He's so good at baseball. He doesn't bang multiple women. <laughs> Holy shit! What an asshole. Uh, man, that made me laugh. So I'm sorry, Will. Unintentionally, you made me laugh really hard. I, I did go with Brandon. I thought that Brandon did a g- really, really good job of being like, uh, of countering the Superman thing of being like, yeah, he's kind of perfect. Well, actually, the first counter of like, dude, he got shot and he had to overcome that. So like, no. Uh, but then to come in and say like, you come to these movies for big sports set pieces, and this guy is the perfect baseball player for these types of moments that you're looking for in these movies. I've seen The Sandlot. I don't love it. I really want to watch The Natural now. Like, Brandon sold me on this movie hard. Like, I've never seen it. I really want to watch it. So I went with Brandon. He wins the point. But, Kirk, where are you going? I actually went with Will. Um, I just think that um... – when I listen to these debates, sometimes I'm like, especially in the situation where I've seen both movies, like I'll say, okay, here are the points you need to make to overcome that. And I don't think Brandon necessarily, I think Brandon just kept checking along at his points and didn't do enough to go after, he wasn't nuanced enough to go out in this one to go after Will's, uh, the points you're making. And I think Will's points were beatable. Uh, Brandon just didn't, you know, go in for the kill. Um, I am glad that Brandon won, though, because he made the objectively correct choice. Um, Roy, Roy's a much better character, but I thought Will did the, did the better argument on this one. Perfect. Okay. So uh, Brandon is up two to zero. That means that Will does need to hit this in uh, this next question in order to avoid the knockout. So uh, we are going to get into that third question, which was drafted by Will. It is in the category of musicals. And the question is, which post-1990s musical is the most fun to watch with friends. Uh, so, Will, you get to kick this one off. You have one minute when you start talking. So I made the absolute sadistic asshole decision to go with one of my sadistic asshole favorites, and that's Repo the Genetic Opera. Why? Because why is this the best one to watch with friends? Because you can get one of two experiences when you do this. One, you can watch it with a bunch of friends who have seen this and can just laugh along to the outrageously silly, gory moments when you see Anthony Stewart Head doing a duet with himself and a victim that he made into a puppet. You can laugh along with all of these things or and my fa- my personal favorite experience, getting a group of friends and one of them hasn't seen the movie. So not only get to we get to watch the movie itself play out and all these wacky numbers and everything, but we get to see someone experience this for the first time and watch their minds just explode at the process. That is a mo- the must-see moment. I love this movie for that. Time. Underrated pick. Uh, let's go to Brandon. Uh, you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. So I went with Anna and the Apocalypse because I think this is the best movie to watch with friends because, to be honest, I like musicals, but not everybody likes musicals. So this movie and the Apocalypse is the perfect blend of everything. Everyone loves zombies. Most, Will and I, last name Cohen, don't like Christmas movies, but most people like Christmas movies. People love the Brits, right? And all of a sudden, it's also a musical. So it's a zombie, Christmas, British musical. 
It has everything. It has the big Disney-esque songs. It's got the great action. It's got a little bit of scares on it from the um, from the, you know, zombies. And it has a lot of heart and emotion to it, too, with her relationship from her father. And it's just perfect for friends because not everyone wants to sit around watching a musical. So they, they get this. You get a little bit of everything for everybody. And there's some hilarious moments with some of the dance numbers, especially when you first see the zombies. And I think it's just the perfect pick because it has, like I said before, it has a little bit for everybody. You're not forcing someone to watch a two-hour time. All right. Anna, The Apocalypse, and Repo, The Genetic Opera, five-minute free form. when one of you starts talking. So I almost, uh, honestly, I almost went with Anna, The Apocalypse. What made me stop and say, no, I'm not going to go with this for one solid reason, that final act. That final act, yes, it has emotion. It has, it, it not only does it have a lot of emotion, it brings the mood down and not even just gradually, it just knocks the beams directly out of you and it comes crashing down. It is no longer the happy, fun affair that the first half of the movie was. By that, you know, by that second half, it's becoming way too dark. It's becoming way too depressing. And when I want to see a movie with my friends, here's a, you know, here's a, you know, here's a good story. I actually saw this with a group of friends. All of us left wanting to die after this movie. That's not the experience you want to have with your friends. You want to laugh. You want to carry on. You want to talk about what your favorite moments were. And that's Repo the Genetic Opera in a nutshell. You get... You get people you wouldn't think would be in a musical. You wouldn't think Paris Hilton would do well in a rock opera, but she's actually knocking out of the park. If Anthony Stewart Head from uh, from Buffy the Vampire, so you have a great cast. Yeah, he, my thing is with just there's nothing being worse than being forced to watch something you don't like. And you kind of said in the beginning, that movie's not for everybody. There's a lot of gross stuff in it. Like I wouldn't feel like me personally, I would not feel comfortable being like, oh, I got this perfect movie for you guys. You got you got heads coming off, you got gore, you got Paris Hilton. It's just un impossible to sell. For me, the other movie is just it's, it's easier to sell. There's more stuff in it for everybody. Yeah, it's a little sad at the end, but you know, it's still hopeful, you know, there's still hope in it because she still overcomes the zombies, moves on with her friends. Yes, she lost her dad, unfortunately, but lots of movies have emotion in them lots of movies have sad moments in them for it's just i wouldn't want to watch if i didn't know what repo the genetic opera was i wouldn't want to watch this if with this gross movie with these long songs and it's like what is going on this is weird i just want to go home and watch something watch kung fu panda it's just not a movie for everybody and i think i think it's easier especially because you have to know your audience you have to get people who haven't seen this before or if you ha have all seen before that great any musical is going to do all right so then you then your pick makes it really ironic then if you're not really looking for you know supreme gore or anything like that because and the apocalypse is very gory there's lots of head splatting you know coming off there's lots of blood splatters there's lots of limbs being severed everywhere and so if you're not looking for that then why would you go with your own choice well because it's done in a different way we all you we all know Repo the Genetic Opera, the campy, the trauma-esque style gore, it's different than the normal zombie-ish. You know, there's nothing really, it's zombie gore, but it's nothing really gross. There's lots of gross moments in Repo the Genetic Opera, and there's nothing nothing in An Apocalypse. Yeah, I watch a lot of horror movies. So my friends can watch horror movies. There's nothing really like, oh, that's disgusting. I never want to eat again, like the stuff that's in Repo the Genetic Opera. Well, you see, and I completely disagree. There were plenty of moments when I saw End of the Apocalypse where I was just completely grossed out and just felt empty inside after watching it. Whereas with Reaper the Genetic Opera, it's coming from the director, one of the directors of Saw, you know, who directed a lot of the Saw you know, uh, films in the franchise. And so you kind of already know what you're getting in, you know, going in with, with that, especially since this is his big passion project. But here's the thing. The question is, what would you want to see with friends? Now, if you've already seen this movie and all your friends have already seen this movie, getting them together and having a big laugh at all of it, you know, all of the campiness, that is fun. Whereas with and the apocalypse, uh, I would want, you know, like, you know, if I want to have a good you know, time with them, I would shut the film off at the hour 15 minute mark and just go, OK, um, 
that's that's all the good campiness. That's all the good fun. Uh, let's go move on to something else before we feel hollow inside. Well, the question says nothing about fun. It says the movie you want to watch with friends. When I watch movies with friends, especially if I'm picking the movie, I want to pick a movie where I where I where they turn it off and they say, "Wow, that was really great." And I think Anna and the Apocalypse, and I love showing this movie to people because I like, I don't even tell them what it's about. I go in and saying, "There's a zombie movie." And they watch it and they're like, wait, there's music into it, but the songs are actually catchy. The songs are great. It seems like they're written for Disney movies and it's just an overall great movie. It doesn't have to be fun. It is fun, but the question doesn't say nothing about fun. It just says, what is a good movie to show or watch with friends? And this movie with the singable songs, the fun action, the horror elements, the heart, everything, it makes for an overall uh, you know, enjoyable watch. There's some dark moments, but enjoyable watch and Everyone I've showed to comes comes off with saying, "Wow, that was a great movie. Why have I not heard this before?" And so, what you're saying is that when you go see, you know, when you get all your friends together, you don't always want them to have fun when watching the movie, because I think when a good group of friends are getting together to watch a movie, that's supposed to be a fun time. Time, okay. Uh, Brandon, we're gonna start with you. You have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. <laughs> So when I get to show friends a movie, I want to pick something that you know maybe they've heard of, maybe they haven't, maybe they haven't seen it. And for me, the perfect I, I I show this movie to my friends all the time. And Anime the Apocalypse is the perfect movie because it has a little bit of everything for everybody. You can have a good time with this movie. It, you know, it's very enjoyable. The songs are great. The first time you see the zombies and they're doing this little dance number, it's making fun of musicals too, which everyone always enjoys because musicals are ridiculous and cheesy. So this is great because you have them dancing in the front, zombies in the background, eating kids, eating people. It's just an overall blast of a movie. It has heart. It has good music. And it's just every person I've showed this movie to says, wow, that's a great pick of a movie. It, it, movies can be sad. You can be sad and still enjoy yourself. I enjoy myself. You know, I have heart. I have emotions all the time. I like feeling things for movies. And I think Anime Apocalypse has everything for everybody. You feel something. You laugh. You cry. You have an overall good time time okay uh let's go over to will you have one minute to close your argument when you start talking so my opponent complained with reboot genetic opera that it's that it's gory that people would not have a good time because it's gross well you can see the exact same thing about and the apocalypse it has you know with reboot genetic opera it has catchy numbers too it has gore but he just said that he doesn't like gore he just said that he doesn't like over the top violence well then why did he choose that film that has over the top violence? Yeah, there's catchy songs, but at least with my film, there's a you know there's a solid happy ending that's consistent throughout the thing. There's a tone that's set throughout the entire film. It's just great, campy fun the entire time. Whereas with End of the Apocalypse, he says that it ends on a high note that there's hope. There isn't because they thought I told you in the very last song, which is no Hollywood ending, that this is not a Hollywood ending. There is no hope. And it's just absolutely sad. And that to me, when I want friends to come over, I want them to be laughing and have a good time, not cry. Okay. Bring the judges. Uh, can I get a repeat on the question, please? Yeah, you can, Kirk, because the question reads, what post-90s musical is the most fun to watch with friends? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, judges, have you guys seen Repo, the Genetic Opera? I have. It's been a long time, but I have. I have, I, I, I used to love it because I'm a weird person. Doesn't the main character die at the end? I'm not letting it judge my opinion. I just thought it. Who who do you who do you consider the main character? The the the, re, the repo man. You see, I consider you know I, to me, I consider the main Does character. The repo man die at the end. Well, does he die? Yes. yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. Oh. <laughs> yeah, goddamn. Uh, no, I just again, it, it's not it's not going towards my uh, vote because uh, it was never brought up. But when Will was like, "It's a happy ending," I'm like, "Doesn't the lead die?" Uh, anyway, um. Kirk, we're going to start with you. Um, yeah, I went with Will. Um, I think Brendan did just lose a little focus on the question. I think he um, 
may have forgot what the question was and kind of conceded the fun aspect about two thirds of the way through the, the argument. Um, I think Will was winning anyway. Um, just I think the real, um, you know, Brandon came at him with, well, you know, your movie's over top and gory. And, you know, Will's right. He kind of picked an over top and gory movie too. So um, kind of conceded that. But I think like just the fact of, you know, that he, um, he kind of gave up on the fun part uh, is what put Will over the top for me. Brian. Yeah, um, I, I I don't like Repo Genetic Opera. Um, I do enjoy an Apocalypse, although not as much as some people in this community. I, I agree the ending, it, it kind of loses steam as it goes on. Um, but I did go with Will, because um, I think that while he made a good argument for why you know, his movie is a better one to pick for you know a, a group of friends who have different tastes, and there's something for everyone, that kind of thing. As far as which one is the more fun to watch, Will kind of painted a picture of uh, the experience you can have actually a couple of different experiences you can have and why it's fun with your friends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I also went with Will. Um, I thought that Brandon did a good job, but I agree that uh, when he kind of said the question says nothing about fun. Well, yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, but actually <laughs> Will, Will never actually like countered that by saying it did. He just kind of went along with it. I was wait, Will, I, I had already like, I, he was winning in my mind already. Had he said that, it really would have sealed the deal. But I think okay. that when uh, Brandon got tripped up on the on the gory stuff, but I understood both sides of it. I understood where Brandon was coming from of like, it's okay to have an emotional ending and all that stuff. Um, but I thought by that point, Will had kind of sealed it for me. So uh, I thought it was a good fight, but yeah, uh, Will takes the point, which means we are moving on to the fourth prep question. This was drafted by Brandon in the category of the MCU. The question is, what is the coolest moment in the first three Thor films? Uh, so, Brandon, you are going to get to kick this one off. you got one minute when you start talking. So those who hold this hammer is worthy and can hold the power of Thor. So I went with, knowing that in mind, that is what makes the character of Thor as he is worthy. So I went with his fight in the beginning, in the first Thor movie versus the Destroyer. Because throughout the movie, in the beginning, you see him all cocky. You see this guy, this kind of douchey god. And then he becomes a total human. And then you're kind of waiting the whole movie and it's building you up. It's building you up. And then finally, Loki sends down the Destroyer. The Warriors three are there, and Thor says, no, this is my fight. Sacrifices himself, and then in that moment, gets knocked, and in that moment, he finally proves himself that he is worthy to hold Mjolnir and hold the power of, of Thor. And for me, that was just the coolest moment because you didn't get to see him as Thor, and then finally it built it up, and you just, it was the first time we saw him on screen, and it was just, I remember seeing it in theaters, so it was glorious. Time. All right. Uh, we're going to move over to Will. Will, you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. So I chose uh, Thor Ragnarok's uh, final battle on the Bifrost Bridge. Why did I choose this? Because this is just the fight to end all fights in a Thor film. This is this was the culmination, not only of Ragnarok, but really every Thor film that came before it. You get to see everyone either have a big redemption arc from Carl Urban's character turning against Hela and just coming literally blazing your guns a blazing. You have the Hulk wrestling a giant wolf into a water fountain, which that sentence alone is just cool in itself. You see Thor coming in with his, you know, with his lightning powers and just blasting everybody. And it's all to the throbbing beats of Immigrant Song. If that doesn't spell cool, I don't know what does. Time. All right. Um, guys, five minute free form. I must ask you to never use the word throbbing again. But other than that, uh, you guys may continue. Five minutes when one of you starts talking. So for me, the knock on the end of... I have a couple knocks on the end of, of Thor Ragnarok. It's that the whole movie is loud and there's a lot going on. And in this scene especially, there's just a lot, a lot going on. And it's kind of hard to follow on the first on the first 
watch. As with my scene, everything is built into this moment. There wasn't much action leading up to that. So you're always waiting for Thor. Where's Thor going to happen? And Thor's on the screen. And finally, he proves himself worthy. And you see, and he just finally overcomes the enemy. And Thor Ragnarok, he has help. You know, I know the question doesn't say anything about it's just the coolest moment, but it's just the moment itself is when he gets the hammer. And I think when he gets the hammer, that is overall the coolest Thor moment and the coolest moment in all of the movies. Well, you see, you said it yourself, the coolest moment, not the most profound moment. If it was the most profound moment, then I would, you know, that would definitely concede that your, you know, your moment is great. But for the coolest moment, you know, when I think of cool, I think of just action packed. I think just great music. I just think just stunning visuals. And your scene, unfortunately, doesn't have a lot of that. And the scene really is pretty brief in comparison, whereas there's a lot to take in. As you said, there's a lot to take in in the first watch. So that means you have to watch it again. Oh, darn. You have to watch this movie again and again. And every single time you watch this scene, there's something new that you get. And it just keeps getting cooler and cooler the more you watch it. So here's my point. Uh, so with my moment, you use the word moment. With your moment, you're using the word scene. So the question is not which scene is the best in Thor. So which moment of that scene are you taking? Because you're because you've talked about, uh, you haven't even talked about the coolest moment of that scene, in my opinion, but you've talked about the Hulk. You've talked about other, you talk about the song, you talk about Scourge, you haven't, those are, those are themselves moments. You haven't picked one specific moment because the question doesn't say what is the best, what is the coolest scene in the first three movies? It's what is the coolest moment. And my moment that I pick is just that. It's a moment. It's the moment he sacrifices himself and becomes worthy of Thor. There are other things I'm thinking of in your scene that maybe in that scene that are better than others yeah i haven't even think you picked the best part of that scene but you haven't picked a moment well you see if you're going to go by the literal definition of a moment who's to say how long a moment can be and that's where you're you know that's where i think you're kind of getting you're trying to muddle my point a little bit here you're trying to muddle this and let's just be honest i'm not going to let you a moment can you know a moment can be three seconds it could be five minutes it could be whatever time you know could be whatever time frame there's not really a time set so if i you know so the fact that i'm going with this entire scene you know the you know, this entire fight on the bifrost bridge that is eligible to be a moment and just because it's dense just because there's a lot going on just because it had you know just because many people get to have the culmination of their own arcs in that doesn't mean that the moment itself is invalidated by it. It doesn't mean that my you know my scene is invalidated just because it's not as brief as your scene is. Okay, but again, you haven't really talked about the kind of what has you said it's all led to this, but you haven't really mentioned what has led to this, what the character arc is. For my character for mine, it's a clear character arc of it's the whole culmination of the movie. You have the guy comes down to earth, loses his worthiness because he's, you know, his head has grown big. And then he completely finds himself, sacrifices himself, becomes the hero. And it's the, it, it is the moment where Thor himself, these are Thor movies. And Thor, in my scene, Thor himself becomes the hero, defeats the destroyer, makes out with Natalie Portman, and just audiences around the world go wild. Okay, so then if you want me to discuss it, I'll discuss it very quickly. So Thor loses his hammer. He loses his, you know, he loses, you know, his father. He loses all hope of getting Asgard back. And so he, you know, so he leads this charge with these new friends that he made to get one last battle in for Asgard. He hammerless, a hammerless Thor manages to still wield lightning powers and still demolish enemies. Then you have Valkyrie who is getting over her own alcoholism and fear and finally getting, you know, finally getting a chance to be the badass that she is. You get Hulk who is getting over his mental illness. There's so many things going on that it's just great. Time. All right. Uh, we are going to start with Will. You have one minute to close your argument when you start talking.
So I do want to reiterate that a moment can be longer than five minutes or 10 minutes. It can be as long as it is because that's still a moment. And just because there's many things happening in a moment doesn't mean it's not a moment. So during, you know, so when the, you know, when the battle kicks off to finishes, it is just action packed. You get to see the scourge have his final redemption. You get to see Valkyrie have her redemption. You get to see the Hulk have his redemption and Thor gets to prove that he is still worthy and still gets to, you know, still be a badass at the end of the day. It's, you know, it's, yeah, brightly colored. Yeah, it's noisy, but you know what? You're still having fun. It is still enjoyable. This is still an absolute, just stellar, cool moment. Whereas with, uh, with Brand, you know, with Brandon scene with the, you know, the thing, yeah, he gets to hold the hammer, but then once he holds the hammer, the fight is over in two seconds. That's, a very fleeting moment. All right, Brandon, we will go to you. One minute to close when you start talking. So Thor is this badass Norse god. You want him to be able to defeat anything put in his way. And for this entire movie of Thor, you don't really get to see him be there. And you're just sitting there. You're watching him on screen. He's great on screen and what he does, but you're sitting there. You want something more. You want him to finally hold the hammer, be worthy. And when that moment happens... It makes the entire movie. Without that moment, it ruins the it, it, it the whole movie's shot. And my and that's why I think it's the coolest because you finally see him get to be worthy. And for his moment, I think it's not even the best. Mo- I, I didn't want to bring it up because he says he said it later on, but it's not even the he finally he realizes he can doesn't need his hammer. But in the next movie, he gets the axe. So that for me, Ragnarok's kind of ruined because of the better scene in Avengers Infinity War. But for my scene, you finally get to see him be Thor. Thor has the hammer, and you can see his worthiness, and it's great. Time. You just recontextualized Ragnarok for me a little bit, Brandon. Uh, Interesting. Uh, Okay, we're going to bring in Kirk and Brian. Um, Okay. I'm going first, aren't I? Oh, crap. Um, okay. A um, couple things here. The semantics argument of what is the moment, what isn't. Will's answer was accepted. Um, so, therefore, I think to say the final battle on the bridge was accepted is is we consider it for the qualifications of this question. Um, that being said, I did go with BC because I thought that Brandon was able to explain to me through the uh, like plot of the first film why when Thor, that in that moment of him sacrificing himself and grabbing the hammer to take on the destroyer is just like dripping with cool. And I thought that will got a little bit caught up in Brandon's uh, jabs of like, of the, well, yours isn't a full moment. Which moment are you picking? Like will got a little caught up in that and like ended up explaining the entire plot of Thor Ragnarok, which he didn't, Mm -hmm need to do at that point um just because brandon basically egged him to um and i think what kind of sealed it for me was brandon actually kind of shooting himself in the foot a little bit by saying there is so much going on there's so much going on well if i'm looking for like a really cool moment i think brandon did a better job explaining why his is very singular the one character the character the movie is about and this moment being cool for that character. So that's kind of what sold me at the end of the day. Um, But I thought it was close. Like at the end, like I I think Will did a good job, but just, I think Brandon overall was able to sell me more. So uh, Kirk. Yeah. Brandon made that very common rookie mistake where he tried to argue the semantics of an already accepted answer, which, um, you know, no shame in that because I think everybody's done that, in, uh, you know, at least once. Um, and Will, I really like that moment. Will was like, I'm not going to let you do that. I was like, yeah, Will, you stand up for yourself. Don't let him do it. But then Will spent the rest of his argument 
defending his moment and why, you know, why it was a moment. So um, at that point, the, it kind of turned into a little bit of a slog. So I more or less kind of because the, the cool conversation at that point had kind of ended. So I kind of go with everything before that. Um, I did, did still end up going with Will, though. Because I think before that moment, Will, from his opening argument, Will was talking about the music and the Hulk fighting the wolf and just bringing up a lot of really cool stuff. And he did, you know, like I agree with him completely. He said if it was the most profound moment or most meaningful moment for the Thor character, yeah, Brandon had it. But if something just cool to watch, it's the right Rock Ridge fight. Okay, Brian, you are deciding this one. Are we moving on to the speed round or are we finishing up? Well, I do think that, um, I mean, if we were talking about uh, the best fight, the best scene, things like that, the, the, the bridge scene is definitely uh, up there. It's, it's, it's very cool. Um, Brandon, I think that in the last question, he uh, kind of forgot the fun aspect of the question. On this one, I think he very wisely zeroed in on the, the moment idea of it. And while, yes, the, the semantics of what, you know, time-wise takes up a moment is, is moot, I think the idea of a moment is, ex is perfectly exemplified with the way we Thor gets the hammer. Cause it's not, and we'll try to downplay it with, okay, he gets the hammer, but it's not about, he gets the hammer. It's about that moment when he becomes worthy to get the hammer in it. And so I thought Brandon did a good job of expressing that. All right. Well, that means your winner is Brandon Cohen. Uh, we are going to go into post match interviews, starting with Will Cohen. Will great job tonight. Uh, you did really well. And I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think Kirk voted for you every time. I could be wrong about that, but I think he did. So uh, I always say this to people, Will, just because I only voted for you once doesn't mean I hate you. I don't hate you. Uh, but I think he did really well this evening. How are you feeling about the match? I'm not mad at it. <laughs> um, I'm just going to be honest. Like, uh, again, I've only been debating for... I think since like Jan uh, since like December of last year when I did uh, some exhibition over in a uh, movie battlegrounds and I had no idea what the fuck I was doing over there. And so I've, I've been learning and these are good, you know, my, my strategy, I thought we were okay. They didn't pan out. That's fine. Brandon, you know, Brandon being an absolute rookie. Uh, I don't believe he's ever debated before. You wouldn't know it with that performance, though. So, you know, who's to say a different? You know, who's uh, one thing I always say whenever I do these debates is a different set of judges could have had a different outcome. And who's to say a different? You know, who's to say, you know, if I had different judges other than uh, Kirk and Brian over here, it could have possibly swung my way. It may not have, but you know what? At the end of the day. Was this a good match? Yes. Is this going to be entertaining as hell for people to watch? Yes. I'm surprised you don't hate me for you know saying the word throbbing. I apologize for that. I couldn't think of it. That's true. That's <laughs> true. I forgot about that. You can want to take me out, but you, you should actually like Kurt because he voted for you every time. So you couldn't do better than that. <laughs> I thought he I thought he voted against me at one time, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know. I wasn't paying attention to that. I was just paying attention to <laughs> is this gonna go my way? By the time that the second point landed, it's like, this is not going to go my way. That's fine. I still had fun. Good. Glad you had fun. We'd love to have you back, Will. So thank you for being on the show this evening. Anytime you want to have me. All right. Sounds great. Uh, Will, thank you for being here. Let's bring in the winner today, Brandon. Brandon, great job. If that is true that you've never debated before, I think Will's right. You wouldn't know based on the performance. I think you did a really good job. Um, how are you feeling about the match? I've been debating for years. It's never on camera. Um, but I, I feel great. Honestly, like, like I said before, I didn't know what I was signing up for. Um, but now that I've experienced this, I'm definitely going to be putting even more work into the next one because I put some work into, I put, you know, obviously put work into this. I wanted to win this, but you know, I, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but this was absolutely a blast. I enjoyed watching this or uh, doing this. And to be honest, I thought like I was prepared to just win like i thought i had the sports one in the bag because of the answer um i haven't seen repo the genetic opera <laughs> to be honest so so i was kind of like succeed in that point in putting more uh stock in the in you know in the other ones um the dreamworks one and i th honestly like i was mad because that thor moment is awesome and that was would have been my pick but you know that's the nature of the game so being able to kind of 
um, and you know, the jabs were into, I was trying to cause a little chaos because I was worried that I was losing that. Cause he mentioned the music and everything, but he never mentioned like him coming down with the, um, with the thunder, which, yeah. which I was kind of alluding to was that is the best moment of that. So to, um, you know, to win that point, that's what I really wanted to win is just try to win that point. But, you know, like you said, the group, I love this group of judges. So, um, I had, you know, I had or two of you, um, I had a great, uh, a great time and I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, I want to, you know, I want to do, do this again. I want to put even more work into this and we'll get better at this because this was, you know, a lot of fun. Well, you're going to have an opportunity to very soon, sir, because you are going to be playing again. Um, you are, will be playing the winner of Tyler Birch and Alex Martinez. Now, two questions for you. A, do you know who either of those people are? I played with Alex before. <laughs> which one would you rather play? Uh, I don't care. I can, I can, I can, I can debate a shoe. I can do anything. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mind. You probably win that one too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's really not a shoe. Um, <laughs> it depends on the shoe. That's for yeah. Sure. I don't care. Uh, I'll go toe to toe with anybody. I'll, I'll come up with my my random bullshit and uh, I'll have fun doing it. All right, lots of toe references. I'm into it, Brandon. Great job. Uh, so, In Tarantino uh, or something? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, great job, Brandon. Uh, we will see you with the next match, um, Brian. Final thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, you know, kind of what you expect from uh, from debut matches. I mean, there's people that kind of you know get to know the format, kind of shake off the cobwebs, kind of thing. Um, I think it's interesting that while Will ended up losing, he's also the only person that swept a question with all the votes. Yeah. So I mean, yep. so both of them definitely had their had their strong points. Um, I am very excited to watch Brandon versus Shu. That sounds like a fun one. I'll judge that one. Um, yeah. yeah. Kirk, what about you? Um, yeah, I, I love it when the person I've well, I don't love it, but it's the best case scenario for me when the person I vote for every time loses because they can't be mad at me for losing. And as far as the winner goes, who cares what I thought? Cause they won. So I'm coming out pretty rosy either way. Um, but no, they, um, I think they both have like the makings of pretty solid players. I think they both have very different uh, ways of coming at the game. And I think they both just need to tighten it up a little bit. And um, I think they could both do some damage. Uh, like I said, both of them, I think, just made some simple mistakes that cost them. Um, but they both have the makings of pretty good players. Yeah, absolutely. I, I could not agree more. Uh, well, that's going to do it for us today at Fan Zone Debate. Thank you so much to Brandon and Will. Thank you to Brian and Kirk for judging this one with me. I have been Tim. We will see you in a couple weeks for the aforementioned uh, Tyler versus Alex. That'll be a good one. We'll see you real soon with that. And until then, have a good one. Thank you very much. Please come again. We have a lot more groceries.